Hello everyone. I hope you've had a great day so far. Uh, we're going to just do a very quick overview of R and uh, RStudio. So I'm, I'm first of all, um, I'm assuming that you have installed R and then RStudio on your Windows or Mac. So I'm just going to run RStudio and uh, we're going to go through some basic concepts and R programming that we need for the Science 1 course, the Introduction to Data Science course at Stanford. And uh, we need R programming to do some visualizations and draw some plots and also import some data into R. And also, I mean, finally, at some step, we're going to, I mean, for week three and four, we're going to also do some classific build some classification models and prediction models. And so that's what we need R for. So we're not going to go through all details in programming in R. I mean, this is not a course um, teaching programming in R, but we're just going to see like some, you know, basic stuff and how to, uh, uh, you know, play out with some data and how to analyze some data in R. That's what we're going to do. All right, so this is our studio. We talked about it last week. And um, just here, this part here is the console, as you can see here. And uh, you can write some code here and run them. So I'm running the R version 3.3.1, which is probably the latest version. I'm not sure. This is bug in your hair. What does that mean? I have no idea what this means. But anyway. Let's just look around again uh, into our studio. Um, so here on this right hand side corner, we have uh, a bunch of tabs here. We have like files, uh, which shows all of our files on our computer. And we have plots. So whenever we do some visualizations in R, uh, all of those plots are gonna appear at this point, uh, at this part. And then we have some packages, which are the packages installed on an R. And uh, so any functions we want to use uh, that, you know, we have to install their packages first, and then we can use them. We'll see this later, especially for visualization. You know, we have to install a library called ggplot, which we're going to do that later. And then this is the help tab, which you can use. And you can easily search here, you know, some of the uh, functions that you want to use and so forth and look up, look up their you know syntax exa exactly how they look like uh, here this uh, part of the window is a uh, environment is the environment tab which shows you know all of the variables that you've defined and their and their values and so forth um, all right other than console here on the left hand side you can click this button here and uh, just in order to create a new R script. So I'm going to click that and here we go. So this is going to be like the editor which you can uh, type in all of your codes and then save it as an R file. So it's going to be like a .R extension and you can I mean change the name. So anytime I mean you type in some code and save it, it's going to ask you for a name and whatever name you put in is going to have an extension of .R. Um, all right. Uh, nothing much. I mean, we can start off with some simple code in R, and then uh, as we go further, I'm going to explain some details, you know, how to run the codes and how to see, uh, you know, the results in the environment tab and so forth. All right, I'm just going to go switch to the slides for week two. Um, I've put up some slides for programming in R in this set of slides. So, I, I mean, as uh, I mean, at this point, I'm, I'm just going to upload the, the slides for week two. So at the moment that you're watching this video, you can also download the slides for week two from the Continuing Studies website as you log in as a, with your student credentials. Uh, you're going to see this, you know, all of the material posted under Science 1, Introduction to Data Science. So you can, um, I mean, at this moment, you can download the slides for week two. And they've put up like almost, I think, 10, 12 slides at the beginning for programming in R, and uh, these are the slides that I'm going to follow, These the first 10 slides of this week, uh, which I'm going to follow, you know, one line by line, 
and uh, we're gonna you know apply them in, in R in R Studio and see what happens. All right. Um, so we talked about this on uh, week the first week, but I'm just gonna go over it again. Um, these are like assignment statements. I mean, I know like some of you have a uh, background in programming, but uh, and you definitely know what what these are. But I'm just gonna mention it here for if someone doesn't have any background in programming. Um, these are assignment statements as we talked about it. Uh, whatever is on the right hand side is going to be assigned to the left. So for example, x equal to 1 means this is a variable x which is going to get the value of 1. Right? I'm just going to do the same thing in R. So for example, uh, you can either write the code here, so x equal to 1, enter, and uh, which, which what happens is that you've defined a variable called x with the value of one and then here in the environment tab you can see like here you have this variable with this value okay or I can do the same thing here in the editor uh, so for example x equal to one All right. before writing the code we said that we can use a number sign to mention comments right so any line of code that has a number sign at the beginning the compiler is not gonna run or compile that uh, that line so it's going to skip that line actually. So here we're just going to say like, okay, some sample code for learning R. Um, and then in the next line, I'm just going to say like, okay, X equal to one and that's it. Um, and uh, I mean, there's a lot of program languages that you need to like put a semicolon at the end of your and uh, end of the code at each line, but you don't need to put it in R. So it's very simple, just X equal to one. And then if you want to run this line of code, um, what you can do is you can select this line of code and then click run, or you can use some of the short keys. For example, in Mac, it's uh, command enter, which is going to run this line of code C. So uh, wherever the uh, cursor is, you don't even need to select this line, you know, the whole line. If, if you have the cursor in this on line three and you select and then you click on run, okay, it's going to run that line of code. Um, all right, I'm going to write another line of code, y equal to 2. So I defined another variable, y, which the value is 2, and then see if I click on either run or just command enter. It's going to run this line of code as well. Now what happens here is I have two variables, x and y. One of them is 1, the another, one, another one is 2. And uh, anytime in your command, in our command line, or even here in your in your code, if you write down the name of the variable and then run it, it's going to print out the value of that variable. So for example, here we can see that uh, the value for x is 1, and then the value for y is 2. And it's basically the same thing. You can see it in the environment tab. I mean, th this is something very cool about R and R Studio that it has this tab in, in, in real time. You can just see like what are the values for the, for the variables that you've defined. Uh, anyway, I'm just gonna uh, erase this. And uh, oops. Oh, okay. So, all right. I mean, as we go further, we just want to you know save uh, our code and this editor. So I'm just gonna click. I'm gonna press Command S or Control S in Windows, which is going to which is going to save. Uh, my R script file, and uh, as you can see here, you can just put in a number, let's say a sample code, and then just save. So it's just going to save this uh, for file, and as you can see, it's sample code dot R. This is the extension for R code. Similar to other programming languages, like in Python, it's dot py, and you know, in C++, it's dot cpp, in C, it's dot C. And so forth. All right, let's go back to the slides. All right, so this was, for example, we looked into this assignment, and uh, and we can basically you can here we're incre incrementing x by one, and then updating x. So here x is one. One is going to copy here to x. So it's going to be one plus one two. So the new value for x is going to be two. Right. Let me do this. So for example, if I type x equal to x plus 1 and then run this line of code by either clicking on run or just command enter what happens is 
x became 2, right? So this is the new value for x. x was 1 at the beginning, and then I just incremented by 1, and I get 2. So two, x is actually overrided with a new value, and that's totally fine. I mean, you can overwrite all of the variables anytime you want. All right, and then here, for example, we're, uh, I mean, we can assign a variable to another variable, but we have to make sure that j has a value, okay? I mean, if it doesn't have a value, it's not going to work. Uh, I mean, you're going to see an error. We can, we can try this. So, for example, let's say x equal to j. Okay, let's see what happens. When I enter, it's going to give me an error and say that object j was not found. Okay, so we need to define the variable j, and then you can do this assignment. So this is not correct. All right. Um, so just... Um, all right, let's go continue the slides. Uh, this was basically all about assignments. Now, there's a lot of basic functions in R, a bit, some basic math functions in R that you can apply. So it's similar to a calculator. You can do any of these uh, mathematical operations. For example, if you just type in 2 plus 2 in the console, uh, you're going to see 4. All right, so this sign here means that we're coding in the console. That's what it means. See, if, you go, if we go back to the console, see we have the sign here. So whatever we type here, for example, 2 plus 2, and then enter, you, you're going to see the results right away. Or you can just write it here. It doesn't matter. Oops, 2 plus 2, and then I'm just going to run the line of code, and you'll see 4 as the result. Uh, something else we talked about last time was this uh, index 1 that you see at the beginning of, your, of the results when you run codes. Um, it just means, like, this is the first element. That's all. That's what it means. Uh, for example, we saw this last time. I'm just going to print all of the numbers from 1 to 20, and see what happens. So this is the syntax for um, printing out all of the numbers from 1 to 20, incrementing them by 1. So, oh, all right. So let, let me do more numbers, like 1 to 40. See? So, I mean, because the output is, like, too long, it has to go to the next line. And uh, this number here is the 27th number of our output. So you can totally ignore these indexes. I mean, they, they just mean like, uh, what is the index of the first element in that line, right? So by looking at this, we know that this is the 27th element of our output. Um, all right, going back to the slides, uh, let's look at another operator. So this is 2 plus 2 to 2. So the result for 2 to 2 is Basically, so this part is uh, actually 4, and then it's going to be plus 2, which is 6. So the reason that this part is going to be calculated first is that the uh, priority for calculating uh, power is more than uh, plus. Uh, and also the parentheses is even more. So, it, I mean, the parentheses has a higher priority. So wherever we have a parentheses, the compiler is first going to calculate the result inside the parentheses and then it's going to go and do a power or multiplication or division and then even after that multiplication and then and division and then uh, uh, plus and minus uh, you can try this out and check I mean what happens so for example um, I'm, if I type here like 2 plus 2 2 3 I'm gonna get 10 because this part is 8 and then plus 2 is 10. Or you can also write, I mean, just for a peace of mind, you can always put parentheses anywhere you want. I mean, just to make sure, like, uh, first of all, 2 to 3 is going to be calculated, and then plus 2. I mean, even if you don't put the parentheses here, but still, it's going to be the same results. But just, it's like a peace of mind, I mean, using parentheses. The great thing about the editor in RStudio is, whenever you open a parentheses, it... Uh, closes the parentheses automatically and then you can start typing you know inside the parentheses that's so cool because uh, uh, you'll never forget to close 
a parentheses or a bracket or you know a bra braces anything uh, for example if I put a bracket here see it closes the bracket itself this is a cool feature about our studio uh, all right and then there are some built-in functions some mathematical built-in functions in R for example square uh, sqrt which stands for square root um, which you can use them and they're not in any special library uh, they're just uh, used uh, directly they're built in so sqrt of 16 should be 4 and here it is okay or right, you can just I mean you can write the code here sqrt of 16 and then run that line of code and again you're gonna get 4 the same thing um, all right log for example the log of some number is again um, I mean log is one of those uh, built-in functions so for example the log of 16 should be 1 I guess it's 2.71 so that's what the the log is I guess in the in this space so it's like this number I guess yeah so this is actually the base of the the log so if you want to change the base you can say like log 10 of let's say 100 it's 2 see like by just putting the number here you can change the base or log 2 of 16 is 4 for example but if you you just use log it's the I mean the base the default base is uh, this number here the E number uh, anyway I mean this is yeah we're not probably gonna use this too much but anyway just for your information I mean I was wondering myself what the base the default base is uh, anyway all right, let's go back to the slides. This is the log, which we talked about, and then x is equal to 5. So this is going to be the value for x. This is going to be the value for y. And then z is a new variable. So I put a, a, a an arrow sign here, which has the exact meaning of equal. It means that whatever is here is going to be assigned to z. Okay, so z is going to be x plus y. And what, what was what is x? x is 5, y is 10. So the new value for z is going to be 15. So when you type in z, you will see 15 as the new value of z. All right? Um, all right. I mean that's pretty simple. So for example, z. I'm going to put an error sign here. Uh, is uh, x plus y. I'm going to run this line of code, and then I'm just going to look at what is the value for z. It's four because it's two plus two, which is x plus y. Um, all right. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, vectors. Well, vectors is a, another very important and so useful data structure in R. Uh, you, you've probably seen, if you are familiar with other programming languages, you've seen like arrays or lists. Uh, they're pretty similar to like vectors. So vectors means um, a structure of uh, uh, a structure which can contain you know multiple values. So the difference between a vector and variable is that variables contain only one value. For example, here, as you saw, for example, these variables can contain only one value, but vectors can contain multiple values. So if we want to like uh, store multiple uh, numbers in one single vector, that's one of the usages of you know vectors. Uh, I'll, I'm going to show you some examples here. All right. Um, now, before getting to the definition of vector, uh, here's another function that sometimes could be useful. It's called SEQSEC, or uh, which stands for sequence. So you can print or generate a sequence of numbers. Okay, uh, let me just show you how it works. All right, so I'm just gonna, I can, uh, all right, I just wanna get rid of this part of my code. So I can comment this whole part by going to code and then comment or uncomment lines so it's going to comment out all of my lines see that's how it works all right it's going to go to the next line um all right um so we were talking about uh the sec function so sequence uh starting from a number and ending at another number and then there's a it has a parameter called by which shows what is the increment so the default increment is going to be 1 uh, if you don't use by 
for example, if I run this, see, it's going to generate all of the numbers between 1 and 10, incrementing by 1. Now, if I include the increment here, for example, let's say 2, let's see what happens. It's going to generate all of the numbers from 1 to less than 10 and incremented by 2. So it's like 2 by 2. So 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and so forth. All right, this function is useful sometimes for generating you know, numbers. Uh, all right, now let's go to the definition of vectors. Here it is. So here's a there's a definition of vector. Uh, this is how we do, we can define a vector. Where uh, again, similar to variables, we define a vector by a name. Let's say v1, and uh, we're just gonna concatenate some numbers. We're just gonna merge some numbers into one vector. So this is how you can define it. Uh, uh, for example. Uh, I'm just gonna say that okay, let's say I'm just gonna do the same example v1 is I'm gonna use C which stands for concatenation or like combine and uh, I'm just gonna put in like multiple numbers in The vector and I'm gonna run it uh, Let's see what happened here now in the environment tab. I got an, a new value here, which is vector v1 and uh, here it's showing me that we I have a bunch of numbers, so it's a, a a vector of numbers, and it has like seven elements from one to seven, showing the indexes. And here are the values. See, even if I point point the pointer here, uh, you will basically see what the values are. So um, I have these numbers. Uh, which the elements are 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 11, the same numbers I put here. Now this is how I define a vector. I have a vector called v1. Now, so if you, I mean, just, uh, if you type in v1 in the console, you will see the output, which are the elements inside the vector. And here we define another vector of the same length, same size, the same length of as we v1. And, uh, all right, I'm just going to change this to red as well, and uh, as you can see, it's just defining another ver uh, another vector v2, and and then we can do some operators on the vectors simply by just adding them up together. For example, uh, so let me go back to R and do the same thing. So I'm here. Uh, I'm just going to create another vector called v2 with seven elements because here I have seven elements. So I want to create one with the same length. Of numbers 5 1 minus 3 5 6 and 4 and then I'm gonna run it I got another vector with oh with six elements so I'm just gonna add another one uh, 12 and then run it all right here we go so I got v2 which is a, a vector of numbers with seven elements and here are the elements 5 1 minus 3 5 6 4 12 all right and then we can simply do some mathematical operations between these vectors just similar as uh, variables so for example v1 plus v2 if i run this line of code i'm going to get 7 5 2 11 13 12 23 which is 2 plus 5 4 plus 1 5 minus 3 6 plus 5 7 plus 6 8 plus 4 and 11 plus 12. Now, this is the reason that I, I mean, I uh, actually generate, I, I, I created two vectors of the same length. I mean, if one of them is with a different length, let's say this one with six elements, let's see what happens if I want to calculate v1 and v2. I'm going to get this error, which is saying that in v1 plus 2, longer object length is not a multiple of shorter object length. Anyway, so it's not able to do a create, um, I mean, calculate this. So we need, I mean, the same length for both. All right, and then so instead of plus, I mean, you can do just minus and then see what happens, just the same thing and uh, so forth. You can try other things as well. Here's another function similar to sequence, but uh, it's doing something else. It's called rep, so it's, it will repeat uh, a number multiple times. See, for example, uh, sometimes you wanna repeat a number, let's say three for 22 times. If you run this, 
it will generate number three 22 times. Sometimes this uh, function is useful. We're going to use it uh, in, in, the, in the future. All right, let's go to the next slide. This is slide number six. Uh, we have some other built-in functions for the vectors. And uh, this is pretty cool. I mean, you can, uh, you don't need to write down, you can, you don't need to write any of these functions. You can just use them. So for example, max of, uh, of a vector is going to give you the maximum element in that vector. Min is going to give you the minimum vector of an element and so forth. Uh, so let's try this out on vector on vector v3. Uh, all right, so, okay, so here I'm just gonna create a vector v3 in order to store v1 plus v2, okay? And uh, let me just get rid of this line of code. Now, so I have v3 equal to v1 plus v2. I'm just gonna run it. Okay, so here's v3, which is v1 plus v2, as you can see. And uh, now I want to see what the maximum element of v3 is. And I'm going to run it. Here it is. It's 23. So 23 is the maximum element of v3. As you can see, this is v3. So obviously you can see, I mean, 23 is the maximum element. Again, you can do the same thing with min of v3 and then run it and then you're going to get like two as the minimum element we have some other cool functions for example length this is kind of cool it's going to give you the number of elements inside the vector how many elements do you have in a vector all right so we know that the length of uh, v3 should be what should be seven here it is because we have so seven elements here uh, another function mean this one is going to calculate the average of all of the elements in v3. This is pretty cool. See, the mean of v3 is 10.42. That's simple. So it's going to add up all of the elements that we have in v3 together and then divide them by 7, which is the total number of elements we have in v3. All right, SD stands for standard deviation, which you don't need to calculate anymore. It's that simple. I mean, Let's say we have a bunch of elements and uh, we want to see what the standard deviation of those numbers are. We can store them in a, in a vector and then just type in SD and it will give us a standard variation, which is, for example, 6.8 in, in, in this example. Or VAR, which is the variance of the numbers. So the variance of V3 is 46.6, which is basically the standard deviation to 2, right? So it's like 6.8 times 6.8, which is going to give us this number. All right. Again, this is um, kind of useful, I mean, because you don't need to define standard deviation of variance anymore. They're built in functions. Um, all right. Now, uh, so far, we've talked about only uh, numbers in vectors. Uh, but we can also store strings and vectors. So instead of numbers, we can store strings. I'm just going to show you how we can do this here. Um, so let me go down here. Now, if you want to save uh, or if you want to show a string, you can use double quotes. So if you put double quotes and then just write your name, uh, whatever is inside the double quotes is considered as a string. So you can, again, define a variable. Let's call it S and say that, okay, my variable is one single string called Muhammad. If I click this, I'm going to get one single variable with this string in it. See, so whatever has double quotes is considered as a string. Um, all right. Now, we can do the same thing for vectors. Here we have like a vector of numbers. Now we can define a vector of strings. So for example, um, uh, I'm just gonna do like V S, let's say a, uh, this is like a vector of strings. Uh, it could be 
like multiple names Hamid and then Dan and Juliana all right and then enter see so I got a, a vector called VS which has these characters inside I mean if you want to like see what the all of those characters are you can pull this back and then you can see okay wait, I have three strings in the in this verb in this vector now there's one uh, important point here that uh, in any vector you can only have the same type of values so for example if this is three characters or three strings here it, it couldn't be I mean any of them cannot be a, a number so for example if I wanted to do the same thing and then instead of one of the names I put a number it should give me an error oh it didn't give me an error but it's uh, it's like it's gonna store number two as a string it'll, it'll do this automatically uh, see the last element is number two but it's stored as a string um, but anyway I mean all of those var values should be should be the same uh, type but so I mean in this case uh, because these two are strings Mohammed and Dan are strings so R is ad automatically converts to to a string anyway this t depends on the you know the compiler but sometimes it's going to give you an error in some versions of R anyway okay um, now here we have a we have a function that is very very useful this is like extremely useful I mean you will see this later why I'm saying this is very useful it's called as dot character this means like if you have a number here that you want to you want to transform it into a string you can use this function so we're going to use of the function as dot character in order to convert numbers to strings or characters okay so for example here as dot character of a number will become a string you can see this here okay now and then similarly there's another function called as dot numeric which will convert a string or a character into a number this is also cool I mean we, we use this a lot as dot numeric of the string 12 is going to be number 12 all right and now this is again you don't need to only apply as dot character or as dot numeric on a variable or on single values you can also apply it on a whole uh, vector for example uh, for example v3 was a vector of these seven numbers now I can apply as dot character to v3 and transform all of my elements in v3 into strings see you can see all of these elements become strings so this is kind of useful and uh, I mean these functions as dot numeric and as dot character are very useful in uh, in real data because a lot of times that you import data into R uh, those columns and you know the the rows or the data that you uh, uh, that you need are not going to be necessarily numeric or characters you know sometimes you have numbers in the spreadsheet and then you import import them in R and you're gonna see them as strings right for example and then you have to convert them into numbers because you want to you know play play around with them as, as numbers so you can use as dot numeric and apply it on that column of data for example in order to convert that column into numbers or vice versa uh, all right we'll see this in some examples later on all right I'm just gonna go to the next slide data elements and um, here in data elements we I'm just gonna show you how we can uh, play around with the indexes of ver of, uh, of vectors this is again very useful and so important so this slide is really important guys I and mean, please focus on this slide and play around with this with these in indexes a lot now 
there's one point about vectors so for example vector v3 which we're looking at has seven elements right now similar to arrays or lists in other program languages uh, here if you want to access any of these elements in v3 you have to use their index and all of the indexes in a vector start from one so this is like the first element this is the second element this is the third fourth fifth sixth and seventh element uh, in some programming languages you may know for example in c plus plus the indexes of arrays or lists start from zero not one but in r it starts from one so this is element number one element number two number three and so forth all right let me go back to the slide so for example if you want to select only one element you can use the name of the vector and then use a bracket in front of it um, so yeah we can use brackets in front of a, a vector name and and then use the index of the elements that you want to access so for example in v3 and vector v3 we want to access the second element so this is how we write it down uh, all right let's look let's do an example so for example in v3 i want to access the fourth element it should be what is the fourth this is the first second twelfth third and fourth it should be 11. so by by clicking this it should give me it should give me the fourth element which is 11. so for example v3 of 7 it should me, give me the last element which is 23. all right so by using the name of the vector and then brackets and then putting the index inside the brackets it's going to give you the um, i mean the element in that vector uh, with this index okay so for example so this means give me the second element in vector 3 and so forth all right now we can also select a range of elements in a vector so for example uh, I mean you know like one um, colon three means numbers from one to three so it's one two three right let me show you I mean if you just type one column three it will give you one two three so if I write down v3 give me the number the first second and third number of the vector see so this was v3 right so it's giving me the first second and third element seven five two because the indexes that you put here are one two three one two three right so these numbers one two three so it's giving me the first second and third element of v3 the first second and third element of v3 okay this is i mean kind of a, this is really important I mean, very very useful so for example v3 of give me the second to the fourth element of v3 5 2 and 11 so this is the second element in v3 this is the third element and this is the fourth element so 2 to 4 means like what 2 3 and 4 so these indexes of v3 5 2 and 11 let's do another example so v3 of from 1 to 7 what does that mean it means basically for all of all of the elements the, the first element to the seventh element in v3 which because v3 has only seven elements so it means like the entire v3 how about if i put v3 1 to 8 what's going to happen it should give me an error right because we don't even have eight elements in v3 so it's out of the bounds but i mean it depends on the, again on the compiler in this case it's just giving us uh uh, na for the last element which means like it doesn't exist but in some compilers in some versions of r especially older versions of r it's going to give you an error and it's going to say that okay this index is out of bound uh, 
But anyway, in this case, it's just handling the error by putting an A at the end. All right, now here's a, a simple trick for excluding an element from a vector. This is, this is kind of cool. I mean, I haven't seen this in many other programming languages. I think this exists in Python, but I haven't seen this in C++ at, at least. Uh, which, so let's say we want to keep all of the elements in a vector, but just want to exclude like one element from that vector. You can use a minus. So minus the index. It's just going to exclude that element. So this is going to exclude the third element inside V3 by using a minus. That's cool because, uh, for example, all right, let's go back to V3. So V3 was 7, 5, 2, 11, 13, 12, 23. I want to exclude 11, okay? Okay, so what is the index for 11? Well, this is 1, 2, 3, and 4. So I have to exclude the fourth element of V3. And what happens? You don't see any 11. You don't see 11 anymore, right? So 11 is excluded because we, um, we excluded the fourth element of V3. Now, uh, now, an important point, I mean, something important here is that V3 has not changed, see? Because I have not overridden V3, uh, okay? If, if you type in like V3 equal to V3 minus 4, what ha what's going to happen here is that it's going to exclude the fourth element of V3 and then overwrite, overwrite it to V3. And then V3 is going to change, right? But I haven't done this yet. All I, I did was I just typed in V3 minus 4, which means that it's going to display the vector V3, which is which has excluded the fourth element of V3, just like that. All right, now slicing is also something very useful a lot of times. And uh, here it means like, uh, uh, it means that again, we just want to include um, some of the indexes or some of the elements in, in, in a vector, okay? So this one is basically very similar to this, selecting the range of elements, but the only thing here is that uh, here we just, we're, we don't want to necessarily select uh, a range of ele uh, consequent elements. We just want to pick like, we want, just want to pick the first, second, and fifth element in vector v3. So this is how we do it. I mean, the C of 1, 2, 5 means that the, this is going to generate the numbers 1, 2, and 5. And then when you put it inside brackets, it's going to pick the first, second, and fifth element of V3. See, I'm going to do a similar example. So I want to say, like, okay, from V3, give me the elements, give me the third, fourth, and seventh element of V3. Here we go. Let's double check. Let, let me look at V3 again. So the third, which is 2, the fourth, which is 11, and the seventh, which is 23, will appear here, right? So this is how I access the third, fourth, and seventh element of V3. So this is called slicing. Okay, now you can do the same thing and then just put a minus here before the C in order to exclude those elements. For example, I can do the same thing, V3 of C of, of I mean V3 of these elements. So I can put uh, a minus here, which will exclude the third, fourth, and seventh element, C. So it's basically the whole V3 excluding the third, so it's exclu ex excluding two, and the fourth, which is 11, and the seventh, which is 23. See, we don't have those elements here anymore. Now, something about RStudio I forgot to mention is that you can use the arrow keys 
for example, if I use the up 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 the arrow up arrow, um, I mean you can you can access the the history of the commands that you've entered here. So you don't need to type them again. So for example, um, if I click up, I'm going to get the latest command that you put in, and then up again, I get the command before, and so forth. You can easily access the history of your commands. There's also another way to access the history here in the environment tab. There's another tab called history, and you can see all of the codes that you've entered or you have ran, ran so far. See, this is all of the code I've written so far, and I've ran, actually. All right, I'm going to go back to my environment tab to see the values of my variables. And um, uh, all right, now let's look at the this one here. Select elements based on logical operator. Now, uh, this here, which means that you can write in a condition here inside the bracket of, of, of a vector. So it's going to select the elements in a vector which meet this condition. So we're looking at all of the elements that are greater than three inside V3. Okay, let me just write this down. So for example, from V3, give me the elements which are greater than 10. Uh, oops, okay, so here's a, here's a mistake. I mean, all right, so this should be not x, it should be v3. I mean, x doesn't really have any meaning because we don't have any x here, right? So this means for all of the elements in v3 that are greater than three, okay, uh, give me those values. For example, so I'm just going to repeat the same thing, but instead of x, I'm going to put v3, and look at this. These are the elements inside v3 that are greater than 10. Now, the reason that we put this in, inside a bracket is because if you just write this expression alone, it's going to give you the indexes of elements in v3 that are greater than 10. See, if I just type v3 greater than 10, it's going to give me, well, it's actually going to give me like true and falses. Uh, so this means like the first element of v3 is not greater than 10. The second one is not greater than 10. The third one is not greater than 10. The fourth one is greater than 10. This one is, this one is, and this one is. So it's returning these four elements to me, which are 11, 13, 12, and 23. All right. Uh, all right. That's all about data elements. I mean, how to access and you know slice values in a vector. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, all right, before getting to data frames, we're just gonna let's just take a quick break. Uh, and you also want if you want to take a break, so I'm just gonna pause this video for now, and then I'll be. All right, let's continue with the slides there's a <clears throat> so the next concept is data frames and it's uh, one of the very useful concepts so I mean we're going to use data frames a lot so it's a it's a super important topic data frames so a data frame is uh, used for you know storing data in R so it's a kind of data structure that is used for storing data, and it's a list of vectors of equal length. So we have like a bunch of vectors as columns in our data, and uh, and then so data frames is actually going to be like a, a matrix, a two-dimensional matrix, and every column is going to be like a separate vector. Um, here, I'm we're just going to start with an example, uh, and we're going to build up. A sample data frame to see how it looks like and how you're able to build a data frame. Um, so here's an example. We just want to build a data frame called students, which has which contains three vectors a, b, and d. So we we're gonna define three vectors a, b, and d, and we're gonna integrate them into a data frame called students. That's what we're going to do. All right, so let's first of all um, uh, just 
define a b and d vectors and r uh, we can I mean I can just copy and paste this area this part of the code into R let's go back to R and uh, I'm just gonna copy it paste here let me remove the uh, greater sign and enter all right here we go so we have a B and D each with the three uh, values one of them is a, a set of characters and, or strings so it's a, like we have like three names here the other one is uh, three numbers and then the other one is again three numbers now we want to build up a data frame called students which the first column is going to be names which we call it name so this is the name of the first column and the values for the first column are going to be the vector a which are these names here and then the second column is going to be called grades and the values for the second column is going to be b so these are the grades for the students for example and finally the third column that we define in our data frame is called heights and so for example it's the heights of the students and the values for the heights are d so here they are here are the values uh, all right so let's build up this data frame for students let's go back to r uh, so i'm defining a data frame called students just as we define a vector or a variable so it's data dot frame this is the syntax and inside the parentheses you have to define the name of each column so we're gonna say that okay the first column is called names for example oops so names and what are the values for names we're gonna call a vector a what is the second column the second column is let's say grades for example and the values for grades are gonna be B and finally the last column is called heights and the values are going to be D. All right, here we go. And that's it. Now, if you look into the global environment tab here, uh, we got a separate uh, uh, section called data. So all of the data frames are going to be under this part. So we have these this other section, which includes all of the variables and the vectors that we have defined, which gives, uh, so they're called like the values. And, but here in this section, we have a data frame. So it's different from, from these guys. If you click on these variables, nothing happens because you have their, uh, val their, their uh, values right in front of them. You can check them here and see what they are, what the va variables and the vectors are. But for the data frame, it just mentions that you have three objects of three variables. So this three variables are uh, basically the three columns that we have. Uh, for example, the names of the students the grades and the heights and three objects means that we have like three students we have three rows so in other words this is the number of the rows we have in, in the data frame and this is the number of columns we have in this data frame now if you click on this students on this data frame see what happens i'm going to click on it and here we go a new tab gets created here and shows the data frame to us so this is a, a very, I mean, a simple example showing what a data frame is. So we're going to be, I mean, keeping all of our data sets inside a data frame. And, and from that point, I mean, we're going to go and, you know, do uh, some visualization and we're going to plot the, plot the data from here. So as you can see, we have three columns. The first column is called names. The second column is called grades. The third column is called heights. And then you can see the values. So for example, David got a grade 100 and his height is like five foot, for example. Uh, Eamon, he got a grade 88 and his height is six. And Jen, again, is 98, got a grade 98 and here is her height, seven, for example. Um, all right, let me make this a little bigger here, all right. 
Um, let's go back to the data frames. All right, so this is how we define a, 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 a data frame at this point. Uh, now next, we uh, just want to access the values and the columns. So we know that the name of the first column or the first column is called names. So how can we access this first column? There are multiple ways for doing this. Uh, so I'm just going to show like one of one of the approaches, one of the first solutions to access the col the, the first column. Uh, you can mention the data frame name students and then use a dollar sign and as you put a as soon as you put a dollar sign it's going to give you three options i mean uh, so this is again one of the uses of you know our studio using an ide which really uh facilitates you know coding in r for so i put a dollar sign i get like three available existing uh column names i got names grades and height you can pick any of them you want so i'm going to pick names which is the first column and then enter and it's going to give me the value, the, the values of the first column. Uh, there's also something else called levels, which you can, we can we're ignore, going to ignore now. Uh, this basically shows like what are the existing values, you know, of a, uh, of, uh, of names. But anyway, this these are the three values that we have in the table. And if you want to get rid of levels, you can uh, just use students dollar sign names and then just put an as that character at the beginning to just receive and uh, just retrieve the the names uh, the strings of names so here it is so we got like David Amen and Jen um, now uh, all right so uh, after this so students uh, I mean, okay, so you can, I mean, we can retrieve the other columns as well. For example, the heights of the students and the grades of the students. I mean, there's no difference. So let's do the same thing. So for example, students, a dollar, let's say grades this time. And we get their grades, right? And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and the same thing for heights. I mean, you can just access the whole column. Uh, uh, all right, let's go to the next slide. Um, so there's a, uh, we're gonna use some built-in data frames in R as training examples. So, uh, I mean, later on, we're gonna see how we can import data into R import some Excel or CSV files into R and put them and load them in a data frame. But I mean, just for training purposes, first of all, we're gonna use some uh, existing, uh, you know, data frames in R and uh, just as training purposes. And then in the uh, next week, we're gonna, uh, I mean, we'll go through like the code that we need to use in R in order to import CSV and Excel files. So at this point, we're just going to look into uh, some built-in data frame in R. It's called, so one of them as an example is called empty cars. Uh, empty cars is in a library called data sets. So uh, we can uh, access this uh, data frame by just typing in empty cars. Um, and just going to show you how it works. So for example, I'm going to say if I type in empty cars and then enter, it's going to print out the whole data set for me. So first of all, just to make sure if you type in empty cars and then enter, and then if you get an error that empty cars doesn't exist or anything, it's because you're, you're probably missing a package called data sets here. So if you're missing this package, just click on install and then type in data sets right data sets and enter but okay so it's I mean in my case I already have it so I just wanted to update it but anyway so you get the data sets installed here and just make sure that you uh, 
put a check mark in front of it just to load that database. Um, or you can also just type in library data sets and then enter, which is going to do the same thing. It's like if you use this function called library, uh, and then the name of the library, uh, the name of the library you put here, well, it's going to load you know any of those existing libraries here. It's just going to put like a check mark in front of it. Um, anyway. So we have like a, a, a data set called empty cars, which we want to use right now. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to assign uh, a variable called, let's say, m equal to empty cars. So I'm just assigning the data frame, the data set empty cars into a variable called m. Enter. See what happens. All right. Here. So I got another data frame, another data set here, which is called M. It has 32 objects, which means it has 32 rows or instances, and it has 11 variables, which are, which are the number of columns. Um, now, simply by clicking on this M here, you're going to load, it's going to load the whole data set, empty cars here, and uh, you can see the rows each which are assigned so each of the rows are uh, or, or are, um, are is a car and each of these columns you, you can see the column names which are different variables so we have like 11 variables 11 columns here and for example the first column is showing the mpg of every car this is showing like the number of cylinders for every car this is display which i don't know what it is this is probably horsepower, and this is something else, and something else. This is the number of gears, maybe, and so forth. So this is an example of a data frame that is already exists in R, uh, and we can use it for some training purposes. So um, yeah, here, the, this is like the, the sample data here. Let's go back to the slides. All right, so this was empty cars. Even if you type in empty cars, it's going to print out like the, the whole data set that we have right now in M. Now, let's take a look at this. So all of the data frames that we have are actually are two-dimensional, right? They're, they're two dimensions. So we have a row and a column. So in order to access any of the cells inside the data frames, we need to know the row number and also the column number to access this number, for example. So we can simply do this by indicating two indexes, the first one showing the row number and the second one showing the column number. Now, let's say, so for example, if I wanna access, let's say this number here, 108 uh, using the index. So I know the row number is a three and the column number is a three as well. So I'm going to write M, which is the name of the data frame. And then inside a bracket, I'm going to put two indexes three, which is the first number is the row number. And the second number is going to be the column number. So this should give me 108. I'm accessing this value. Let's look at like, I don't know, like something else. Let's, let's look at this. We want to like pull out or this value here. Okay. So this is row number two and then column number one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's M two, six. It's 2.875. This is the value. In other words, in order to access any of the cells inside a data frame, you need to use two indexes. The first index indicates the row number, and then the second number indicates the column number. It's that easy. All right, let's go back here. All right, here's the example. I mean, we just, we access empty cars or M because we copied empty cars into M. And this is the index of the row number and then the index of the column number. 
and then you're going to see you will get the value assigned to that cell. Um, there's also another way to get the same value, which is we can use the row name and the column name, right? And the row name and the column name are both strings. That's why we put them in double quotes. Let's do the same here. So instead of using m of 3 and 3, we can say m of, instead of 3, I'm going to put the row number. So 1, 2, 3. It's Dotson 710. So Dotson 710. And the column number, the third column number is disp. So I'm going to put disp, enter, and it's going to give me the same value that I got here. Uh, in general, I mean, just, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, like, most of the experiences uh, I've had myself is that usually using these uh, indexes is uh, pretty easier than using, you know, column names and row names. Well, easily because, uh, simply because it's, uh, simply because the name of the rows and you know columns are usually uh, pretty longer, but you know you can just use like a simple index uh, in order to access the same elements. So it's pretty easier, you know. And this is the way we usually go with. We use just the indexes, the row number and then the column number, right? Uh, okay. Now that's it. Um, now, there's two other simple functions that are used widely. I mean, we use it, we use them a lot of times. And one of them is called nRow, which is going to give us the number of rows in the data frame or the number of instances we have. And also, the other one is nCall, which is going to give us the number of columns in the data set. So let's go back to our example. The n number of rows of m is 32, the number that we have here, 32 objects. And the number of columns of m is 11. So these two simple functions are used a lot, I mean, a lot of times. Um, even though we have these two numbers here, but, you know, a lot of times that uh, we don't really know what the number of columns and rows are going to be. Uh, we can simply just use the number of row of m and the number of column of the data, the end call of the data frame, uh, simply by using this. You know, if like, I don't know, if like, or in order to, I mean, build up a dynamic, you know, program and uh, measure, you know, the number of rows and columns, we can use these two functions here. All right. And finally, this is the last slide for data frames and uh, for you know basic programming in R um, so here's the cell value from the first row second column of empty cars well yeah I'm just gonna I mean remove this Yeah, we don't really need this part. Um, all right, so we're, this part, we're just going to talk about like the column names. I mean, how can we access the column names? Sometimes this is very useful as well. Uh, so for example, I mean, here I'm just copying empty cars into my cars, which I already have it in, in, a, in another variable called M. So I'm just going to be using M instead of my cars. And here's a new function. It's called call names, which will return the column names of my data frame. So the call names of any data frame is going to print out the column names for you. For example, let's go back to our example. The call names of M is going to be C, like MPG, Cylinder, Display. So it's the same column names that we have here and which should be 11. So that's why we have 11 elements here. 
And, uh, and then if you want to access any of these, you can use their index. So for example, this is the first one, this is the second column name, this is the third one, and so forth. So we can use column names of M, and then inside a bracket, put the index. So this should give me the third column name of M, which is disp. So if I enter this, I'm going to get disp. Uh, and sometimes it's kind of like useful to change the column names. I mean, sometimes you have to do this because when you import the data into R, uh, you know, some of the column names don't really make sense and you just want to change some of them, you know, manually. So what you can do is you can say that, okay, the I want to change the third uh, column name, the third column name to something else. Let's say no name, for example, just for fun. Now, if I look into call names of M, the third column name should have changed to no name. So here it is. See, uh, here the third uh, column name is changed to no name. All right, let's go back to our slides. So yeah, this is how we change the header names. So for example, the column names of this data frame, the first one, so, oh, I have to remove this here. So the first, um, the first column name in my cars or an M is going to be changed to no name. So when you type in the column names, you're going to see like the first column name changed to no name, and then the rest are the same. Or for example, you can you can change like the first three column names to three other names to, for example, to no name and no name one and no name two. And then when you check out the call names, the column names, you're going to see that, okay, these three names changed. Okay, it's just going to show it to you in R. So for example, let's say the column names of M, uh, the, let's say, let's change the first to the third one. And so we have to assign like three different strings for the column names. Let's call the first one, a, the second one B, and the third one as C. Let's see what happens. Now, when we check the column names, I mean, you can either look into this updated data frame. See, it's basically because here we reassigned the call the three first the first three column names of M into A, B, and C, and you can see the changed a b and c and the rest of the column names are unchanged all right so that's all for this uh tutorial uh i'll probably include more details and more uh coding in the next tutorial however let me also do the solve uh, the homework that we had for the first week. So the first homework for the last week was, uh, let me look at, look what it was. It was, we had for the first week, we had like two lab works, I guess. So the first one was to Write a code in R which swaps two variables. Uh, all right, so we're going to be looking into this. Let's say we have two variables and we just want to swap their values. So I'm just going to go in R. I'm going to go back to my sample code here. Just going to uh, comment everything. And then, all right, I'm just going to write a comment here. So code to swap. Um, code to swap what? To swap numbers, or not numbers, let's say variables. And uh, to swap variables, all right. Now, what we're gonna do here is, uh, let's say X is some number, eight, and then Y is 12. Now, what I'm going to do is we want to swap these values, right? So x should be 
x should become 12 and y should become 8. If I assign x to y directly, uh, the problem is that y is going to overwrite x and then we're not going to have this value anymore. I mean, we're just going to lose it. So what we're going to do is we're first going to copy x into a temp variable and then with a peace of mind we can copy uh, and then so because we have x in temp now we can rewrite x with y and then we can also copy temp into y so I've, after this we print x and print y let's see what happens so I'm just going to grab this part of my code and run it and see what happens. So the value of x becomes 12 and the value for y becomes 8. So these two values are swapped, right? All right, now what's the second problem? So the second problem is write a code in R, which given your first and last name, it prints your full name. All right, so we're gonna, so what we're gonna do here is uh, let's say, let's define a variable called first. Just gonna put my, my own name and then I'm just gonna define a last name right and then there's a function called paste which you can use to paste two variables uh, and with, so this function paste is going to uh, put I mean combine or concatenate two strings together and as a default, it's going to put a space between them. So let me run this part of code, this part of my code. And here we go. I get my first and last name. How about if you want to remove the space between these two strings? Well, you can add a third uh, parameter called sep, which means the separator. See, when I type sep, it give, give me, gives me an option, sep equal to. So sep is equal to, I can put like nothing here, right? So no space, I'm just gonna remove a space, just put like double quotes with no space. Now if I run this part of my code, it should concatenate my first and last name with no space. See, here it is. So the first name and the last name with no spaces. All right, that's all for today. Hope to see you guys on Thursday. And uh, I wish, uh, I hope this uh, tutorial has been useful for you. We're gonna have a small game next time from all of the all of the the codes and the material and the slides for the I mean the material that we uh, I, I talked about during this video plus the slides of the first week. So we're gonna have a small game and as I as I said before, the, whoever becomes first in the game is gonna get an A plus hopefully. All right, guys, take care. See you guys soon. Bye bye.